Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare, Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama Rama, Rama, Hare, Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Hare, Hare Hare Rama, Hare Rama Rama, Rama, Hare, Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Krishna, Krishna, Hare
Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 3, Chapter 1, entitled Questions by Vidura, Text 28. There's no purport for this one, all the next ones just got a little one, so I'll be reading from 30. So we'll go to, start at 28 and move forward. Kachid Vuru Tadipate Yadunam Prayumana at Sukam Agga Vidaha Yam Rukmini Bhagavato Pelebe Rajya Vipran Saram Arisage O Uddhava, please tell me how is Pradyumna, the commander-in-chief of the Yadus, who was cupid in a former life? Rukmini bore him as her son from Lord Krishna by the grace of the Brahmanas whom she pleased. Purport. According to Srila Jiva Goswami, Smara Kupador Kamadev is one of the eternal associates of Lord Krishna. Jiva Goswami has explained this very elaborately in the treatise Krishna Sandhava. Text 29. I'll just give it the translations of 29 and 30. Oh my friend, tell me whether Ugrasena, the king of the Sakvatas, Vrishnis, Bhojas and Dashas, is now doing well. He went far away from his kingdom, leaving aside all hopes of royal throne, but Lord Krishna again installed him. And now for 30. O gentle one, this is a translation, O gentle one, does Samba fare well? He exactly resembles the son of the personality of Godhead. In a previous birth, he was born as Kartikeya, in the womb of the wife of Lord Shiva. And now he has been born in the womb of Jambavati, the most enriched wife of Krishna. Purport. Lord Shiva, one of the three qualitative incarnations of the personality of Godhead, is the planetary expansion of Krishna. Katikeya was of him, was born of him is on the level of Pradyumna, another son of Lord Krishna. When Lord Krishna descends into the material world, all his planetary portions also appear with him to exhibit different functions of the Lord. 
But for, for the past times at Vrindavan, all functions performed by the Lord's different planetary expansions. Vasudev is a planetary expansion of Narayan. When the Lord appeared as Vyasudev, Vasudev before Devaki and Vasu, before sorry, when the Lord appeared as Vasudev before Devaki and Vasudev, he appeared in his captaincy as Narayan. Similarly, all the demigods of the heavenly kingdom appeared as associates of the Lord in the forms of Pradyumna, Samba, Uddhava, etc. It is learned here that Kamadev appeared as Pradyumna, Kartikeya as Samba, and one of the Vasus as Uddhava. All of them served in their different capacities in order to enrich the pastimes of Krishna. As well, I just ask for the blessings of the senior devotees so that I may say something of value. My obeisance to Sri Lopalpad and my spiritual master. So, in this chapter, we've been hearing about the transcendental pastimes of Fedora. Um, and as Rupa Raghunath was describing yesterday, he's beginning to ask some questions. And the first thing he was asking was about Krishna. And now he's asking about um, his associates. So, uh, Vidura is an extraordinary personality. Um, we often hear his name in the Mahabharata. A big personality within that story. I just wanted to touch on some of my realizations from this whole chapter. And what we can learn from such a personality as Vidura. And also talk a little bit about um, what we can get from hearing such nectarian pastimes of such personalities. So we see a few verses ago how he was driven away by Duradhan um, due to him giving advice to um, Dhritarashtriya. And um, Vidura was one who never left Dharma. If you look at his stories throughout the, the scriptures, and um, the amazing thing about that, he was always tossed among some favourable situations. But he always stuck to Dharma. Um, and Vidura had never seen things on the material platform. Even though he was mistreated by his own family members, he still seen it from a Krishna consciousness perspective, seeing Krishna's hand in everything. He saw it as the Lord's external energy, which was helping him to be fully engaged in Krishna's devotional service. And this is an important point to see the Lord's hand in all areas of our life. The Lord is said to take charge of those who fully surrender unto Him. Uh, and we have a tendency in today's age to blame our surroundings, this person is doing this, situation is causing me to do this. But we should take the great we should take examples of the great devotees like the Dura and to see things as although things aren't going my way or things may be getting difficult in my life, I'm gonna look deeper into all these situations. I'm gonna look deeper into my own life. This is Krishna consciousness, to see Krishna's hand within all of our life. And uh, just because it doesn't taste good, doesn't mean it's not Krishna's hand. That's the thing we often experience in today's world. Sometimes we need a push, a shove. Sometimes what looks like an absolute disaster is the Lord's mercy. Most of the time that's the case. And there's a beautiful uh, verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam, 10.88.8. It's uh, a real famous verse. If anyone's got their phones, you can bring it up. I'm going to read that verse because it's such a special verse. And it shows how the Lord gives his mercy to devotees. And sometimes it's not in the most bright, favourable looking way. So the translation is, the personality of God had said, if I especially favour someone, I gradually deprive him from his wealth. Then the relatives and friends of such poverty-stricken men abandon him 
In this way, he suffers distress after another. And Srila Prabhupada goes on to say in the purport, Devotees of the Supreme Lord experience both happiness and distress, not as consequences of material work, but as incidental effects of their loving reciprocation with the Lord. Srila Rupa Goswami in the Sri Bhakti Rasa Ruta Sindhu has definitive treatises on the process of devotional service, explains how a Vaishnava is relieved of all karmic reactions, including those that have not yet begun to manifest. Those that are just about to manifest, and those that have barely manifest, and those that have manifest fully. As a lotus flower gradually loses its petals, so a person who takes shelter of devotional service has his karmic reactions destroyed. That devotional service of Lord Krishna eradicates all karmic reactions. It is confirmed in a passage of the Gopal Tapani Shruti. Devotional service is the process of worshipping the Supreme Lord. It consists of fixing the mind upon him and becoming disinterested in all material designations, both in this life and in the next. It is the result in the dissolution of all karma. While it is certainly true that those who practice devotional service remain in material bodies and apparently material situations for some time, this is simply an expression of the inconceivable mercy of the Lord, who bestows the fruit of devotion only when it has become pure. In every stage of devotion, however, the Lord watches over his devotee and sees the gradual elimination of karma. Thus, despite the fact that the happiness and distress devotee experience resembles ordinary karmic reactions, they are in fact given by the Lord himself, as stated in the Bhagavatam 10.87.40. A mature devotee recognises the superficial good and bad conditions he encounters as signs of the direct guidance of his ever well-wishing Lord. But if the Lord is so compassionate to his devotee, why does he expose them to special suffering? This is answered by analogy. A very affectionate father takes the responsibility of restricting his children's play by making them go to school. He knows that this is a genuine expression of love for them, even if the children fail to understand. Similarly, the Supreme Lord Vishnu is mercifully strict with all his dependents, not only with mature devotees struggling to become qualified, immature devotees struggling to become qualified. Even perfect saints like Prahlad, Dhruva, Yudhisti were subject to great tribulations, all for their glorification. After the battlefield of Kurusetra, Sri Bhishmadev described to King Yudhisti his, his wonder at this. Oh, how wonderful is the influence of the inevitable time. It is irreversible. Otherwise, how can there be reverses in the presence of Kung Yudhisti, the son of the demigod controlling religion, Bhima, the great fighter with her club, a great bowman Arjuna with his mighty weapon Gandiva, and above all, the Lord, the direct well-wisher of the Pandavas. O king, no one can know the plan of the Lord, Sri Krishna, even though great philosophers inquire exhaustively, they are bewildered. Although a Vaishnava's happiness and distress are felt as pleasure and pain, just like ordinary karmic reactions, they are different in a significant sense. Material happiness and distress arise from karma, leave a subtle residue, the seed of future entanglement. Such enjoyment and suffering tend towards degradation and increase the danger of falling into hellish oblivion. oblivion. Happiness and distress generate from the Supreme Lord's desire, however, leave no trace after their immediate purpose has been served. Moreover, the Vaishnava who enjoys such reciprocation with the Lord is in no danger of falling down into nuisance. As Yamaraj, Lord of Death, and the Judge of all departed souls, declares, My dear servants, please bring me only those sinful persons who do not use their tongues to chant the holy names and qualities of Krishna, whose hearts do not remember the lotus feet of Krishna even once, and whose head do not bow even once before Lord Krishna, 
Smear those who do not perform their duties towards Vishnu, which are the only duties in human life. Please bring me all such fools and rascals. 6.3.29 The beloved devotees of the Lord do not regard as... These, the beloved devotees of the Lord do not regard as very troublesome the suffering he imposes on them. Indeed, they find that in the end it gives rise to unlimited pleasure. Just as a stinging ointment applied to a, by a physician cures his patient's infected eye. In addition, suffering helps protect the confidentiality of devotional service by disencouraging intrusions by the faithless. And it also increases the eagerness with which the devotees call upon the Lord to appear. If the, Lord, if the, if the devotees of Lord Vishnu were com, complacently happy all the time, he would never have a reason to appear in this world as Krishna, Ramachandra, Nishinga, and so on, as Krishna sees himself in the Bhagavad Gita. To deliver the pious and annihilate the miscreants, as well as to re-establish the principles of religion, I myself appear millennium after millennium, and without the Lord showing himself on earth in his original form of Krishna and in the forms of various incarnations, his faithful servants in this world would have no opportunity to enjoy his rush of Leela and other pastimes. And this is a really nice part. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti here counters as possible objections. What fault would there be in God's incarnation for some other reason than to deliver saintly persons from suffering. The learner Chari responds, Yes, my dear brother, this makes good sense, but you are not expert in understanding spiritual moods. Please listen. It is at night that the sunrise becomes attractive. During the hot summer, that cold water gives comfort, and during the cold winter months, that warm water is pleasing. Lamplight appears attractive in darkness not in the glaring light of the day. When one is distressed by hunger, food tastes especially good. In other words, to strengthen his devotees, mood of dependence on him and longing for him, the Lord arranges for his devotees to go through some suffering. And when he appears in order to deliver them, their gratitude and transcendental pleasure are boundless. A little bit of nectar for you all. Sure, Paul Park here. So Krishna's there. He's guiding us home, as described in the Bhagavatam Rita. But sometimes we don't see it like that. Um, it can be very hard to see it like that here within the material world. There's so much going on, so many things to overcome. Krishna Kirtan would always say that um, our, our body is like a wet dog and our mind is like a bunch of balloons in the wind. So it's very hard to control. Then we've got the, then we've got the uh, three modes of material nature, Sattva Goon, Tama Goon, Raja Goon, like puppet masters. Then we've got the threefold miseries, uh, Adi Devaka, so we've got the problems, some of the demigods, we've, got, we've had that recently, uh, lots of floods, we get the fires, we get the earthquakes, uh, Adi Buddhika from other living entities. Once we get some relief from that, then we get other living entities coming at us. Then Ayatmaka, then it's our own mind, which is everyone's main problem, I think. Their own mind. Then we've also got the... Uh, the four defects of conditional life, we're under illusion, we cheat, uh, we make mistakes, and we have imperfect senses. Uh, birth, death, disease, old age, Facebook. So we have all these distractions and things that we have to overcome to see Krishna in our life. So it can be really, really difficult to put Krishna in our life, to put Krishna first in our life. There's a lot we need to work through. There's a lot that we have to overcome. And we have to really, really work on ourselves to get to that level. I was, did a, um, there was a seminar which I did last week with one of my old mentors, 
um, Bob Proctor, he's now left his body, but one of his um, students was running that. And they're all into prosperity. They're all into business and so forth. And their minds are so focused on their goals, whether it's to uh, bring out a new book, to create a new program, to start a new business, um, to combine with another business. It's just every day they wake up, they meditate on it, they think about it, they write about it, they spend time with people who have achieved it. And I was listening to him and I was like, you know, this is what we must be like in Krishna consciousness. Because sometimes we do get really comfortable in Krishna consciousness. We just go about the day. We wake up, we come to Mongolati, we chant our rounds, we just get out into our day. And we just slowly just fall into our own old habits, into our old ways. But we should always be super aware and super present and super conscious. If there's people out there are super, super conscious about money and being successful in this certain area of life, uh, we should strive to be more than that, especially when it comes to Krishna. And this is real Krishna consciousness. And uh, another, thing we, another thing we've seen within this chapter is uh, the Dura. Uh, he, he, he thought that he lost all his piety due to his association. And he starts travelling, and that's what we're seeing now. And he's travelling to holy places. And that got me thinking about uh, holy places and how fortunate we are to glance upon Krishna and to chant and to hear and associate with devotees every day. Uh, we're so fortunate that we get to experience this. And one little point for before I move on, the, with the travelling to holy places, I remember hearing a story about Srila Prabhupada and when he first came to America and he was with some of the, the new devotees and they never felt like this before. There was something amazing which was in the room. They couldn't quite put their finger on it. They knew he was an extraordinary personality and the first thing they couldn't quite put their finger on what that presence was, what he was bringing to that room. And one of the devotees, they went to India the first time, to Vrindavan, and they felt that same feeling. And they put two and two together, and they said, actually, Srila Prabhupada, wherever he goes, he's bringing Vrindavan with him. So I thought that was really beautiful. So coming back to taking advantage of these holy places, um, of the association of devotees and so forth. And we're so lucky here at New Devadan that we've got it all at our palms, of our two hands. But once again, we've got to be really, really careful because we can fall into our old traps again, into our own way, our old ways, and whether it's not appreciating this holy place, not appreciating our association which is around us. And that's one problem we see around the world is having problems with others. But Srila Prabhupada would always say that we need to see other devotees as um, better than kings, he would say. He wrote this letter in 1972 and it's about taking advantage of spending time with devotees and getting the association of devotees and um, how we should be around devotees. And I was going to read that today. I got it from, um, get who it was now. Beautiful devotee. I, I was associating with him for a day and we, we read this together. And I thought I would share it today. So it's from Srila Prabhupada, it's to uh, Atriya Rishi. And it says, Please accept my blessings. I am in due receipt of your very nice letter of January 10th, 1972. And I am very much pleased by the sentiments expressed therein. 
It is not so much that because there may be some faults in our God brothers and God sisters or because there may be some mismanagement or lack of cooperation that this is due to being impersonal. No, it is the nature of a living condition to always have some fault. Even in the spiritual world, there is some fault and envy. Sometimes the gopis quarrel over Krishna's favour. And once Krishna was so much attracted to Radharani that by mistake he tried to milk the bull instead of the cow. Wow. <laughs> and sometimes when the gopis used to put their dress and makeup for seeing Krishna, they would do it too hastily and smear kumkum and mascara in all the wrong places. And their ornaments and dresses would appear as if a small child had been trying to dress themselves. And they were not very expert like that. There are so many examples, but it's not the same here. It is not the same as material fault or material envy. It is transcendental because it is all based on Krishna. Sometimes when one gopi would serve Krishna very nicely, the others would say, Oh, she has done so nicely. Now let me do better for pleasing Krishna. This is envy. But it is transcendental without malice. So we shall not expect that anywhere there is any we should not expect that anywhere there is utopia. Rather, that is impersonalism. People should not expect that even in the Krishna conscious society there will be utopia because devotees are persons, therefore there will all be some, there will always be something lacking. But the difference is that they're lacking because they have given up everything to serve Krishna. Money, jobs, reputation, wealth, big education, everything. Their lacking has become transcendental because despite everything they do, their topmost intention is to serve Krishna. Despite the most abdominal action is to be considered saintly because he is rightly situated. The devotees of Krishna are the most exalted persons on this planet, better than kings, all of them. So we should remember that. And like the bumblebee, always look of a nectar, of the best qualities of a person. Not like utopians who are like the flies who always go to the open sores or find faults in a person. And because they cannot find any utopia, because they cannot find anyone without faults, they want to become void, merge, nothing. They think this is utopia, to become void of personality. So if there is sometimes slight disagreements between devotees, it is not due to impersonalism, but it is due because they are persons, and such disagreements should not be taken very seriously. The devotee is always uh, pessimistic about the material world, but he is very optimistic about the spiritual life. So in this way, you should consider that everyone, anyone engaged in Krishna's service is always the best person. That's half of it. I always read that. It's always nice to meditate on just how we should see devotees. Sometimes we forget. There's always going to be disagreements and troubles, but we should also see the best in devotees. So it's very important we should always be filling our mind with this. This would help us become Krishna consciousness for our association, um, to come into the temple, travelling to holy places and so forth. This keeps our mind sharp, it keeps our mind Krishna conscious. In the Bhagavad Gita it says uh, in 6 6, for him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best friend, but for those who have failed to do so, the mind is the greatest of enemies. And there's a, a story about the power of the mind and how important it is to tame the mind. We're so fortunate here within ISKCON that. We've given all these devices to train the mind and to keep the mind focused. So there's a story, it's from 1982, and there was a railroad um, uh, train, and they were working on that, a big group of people. And there was a young man who was in his 20s, he was big, he was strong, he was good looking, he had a beautiful wife, he had a couple of children. Everything was going for him. And it was Friday afternoon and everyone's getting a bit excited. You know, maybe we'll go to the pub this afternoon. And they all rushed off and he was still working in one of the carriages. 
and that carriage which he was cleaning was a refrigerator department. And as the other men were running off, they shut the door and they left him in the refrigerator department of the train. And this young man's in there and he's banging his fist on the doors. His mind's getting very disturbed. Boom, 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 boom. And after a while, there's blood coming from his fist. He's so determined to get out. He's so worried. And the day goes on. The day passes into night. And he's really concerned now. And he has a a pen in his pocket. And he starts to get out that pen. And he starts to write on the on the wall of a refrigerator. I'm stuck in here. It's getting really, really cold. That was one line. Then after a while, the night passes on and he writes again. I can't feel my hands. I can't feel my feet. I'm in trouble here. The night passes on more and he writes on the wall again. I'm starting to get really tired. I feel as though I can fall asleep at any stage. I think this might be my last words. And the next day, everyone arrived to work and they opened up the refrigerator to find him laying there. And he was dead. And Everyone was really confused because that night when he was left in that refrigerator, the actual system was not even on. And through his own mind, through his own mind and his own belief, he froze himself to death. So this is a story which has been getting told since 1982 around the world. Is it true? Is it, is it not true? But the, the, the moral of the story is just how powerful our mind can be. And if we don't take control of it, it can lead us to some very dark and dangerous places. So we should always be super aware and super consciousness on our path of Krishna consciousness. Always taking advantage of everything within Krishna consciousness. Taking advantage of our association, taking advantage of our chanting, taking advantage of our programs. Um, and most of all, taking advantage of, advantage of everything that Srila Prabhupada has left behind. His books, all these wonderful books that he's written. So just to summarise, um, always to do our best, like Vidura, seeing Krishna's hand in our life, even when things aren't working out for us, not so much blaming our surroundings, this person, that person, but seeing the changes um, and so forth as Krishna's hand. And also taking advantage of what we've got before us in the holy places, Nugavadanta holy place, um, Krishna, um, association with the devotees, the chanting, the hearing. So I'll finish there if there's any questions. I say, I come from a bodybuilding past, and when it's a bodybuilding, a bodybuilding analogy, <laughs> um, like, like you know, the, the mind—it's—it's it's like a, you know, like a bicep. 
So if you want big biceps, you have to go and train your biceps. You do repetitions, you do sets, you do different exercises, you hit different parts of the muscle. And after time, that muscle grows and it becomes strong. So this is, this is what Krishna consciousness is all about. We have to be very conscious of where we're at and where our mind's at. So when we're new to Krishna consciousness, we have to understand that um, the mind is going to be weak. You know, someone who's just come into Krishna consciousness, who someone hasn't really trained their mind throughout their life, their mind's going to be very weak in the very beginning. But it takes training. And we have to see the situations in our life which are coming at us, which may be Maya pulling at us or certain people saying things to us or certain situations happening, we have to use them as our dumbbell and see that these situations are the things that are going to make my mind stronger or make me stronger. So that's how we should see everything in our life. As opportunities to grow, I kind of see things as stepping stones. And we have to know that the, the, the mind's very, very weak. It says it's, harder, you know, it's, it's, it's also harder to control than the wind. So we have to be very determined and very patient and know that it's not like an overnight thing to become like a master of one's mind um, or to be super Krishna consciousness. But it just takes time and you have to be very patient with that. Yeah, just see the mind as a muscle. And all the, all the situations that are coming at you as uh, things that you can use to grow yourself in Krishna consciousness. Yeah, it's very important. Yeah. And always put yourself in the best possible association. Um, always do what you can do. Um, and Krishna consciousness is such an amazing thing. And like I was talking about, you know, these people who uh, are entrepreneurs and they, they drive forward down the, the, the business way of life trying to achieve lots of money and all these kind of things. They're super focused on their goal. So when problems happen in their life, it's, harder for, it's easy for them to overcome them. So when we get to a stage in our own Krishna consciousness, when we're really focused on our goal, and someone within Krishna consciousness, their goal is to become you know, the servant, the servant of a servant, or to serve Krishna, then these problems kind of minimize and you, you see them for as they are because you've got a goal and you use them as stepping stones to get to your goal. You know, once again, I, I, I spoke about this, like you can't, you can't grow anywhere where, where it's just easy. It, it's very hard. It's the same as muscles. Mus muscles don't grow just doing, you know, like licking air. There's got to be some toughness there, some friction. So Krishna's going to put some friction there in our life. It's going to put some difficulties there. But these are the things that make us stronger. And they bring us closer to Him. So yeah, um, be clear on where you're going and what you want to achieve within Krishna consciousness. And yeah, these little hurdles and you've seen as these little stepping stones. Yeah. Thank you. You have now? Also, there's, there's one mantra still. Did you keep chat? How should you remember Krishna? <laughs> Hare! And mantra means what? <laughs> I was, I was, I was reading a, a book of Ellie's the other day, which is by Kandama Kanana Maharaj, and it's really nice. It talks about chanting. <laughs> it talks about chanting. It's really nice and. The, the main thing about chanting is this is like any other mantra because there's so many mantras within this world and you can go to this place or that place and chant this and chant that and it's, and it's really nice, you know. We're chanting kirtan, we're chanting some mantras. But the Hare Krishna mantra is very special because the Hare Krishna mantra is actually a personality. It's not just some words, it's not just this and that. The Hare Krishna mantra is actually Krishna. So we're actually dealing with a person when we're saying this, when we're singing this, it's a relationship. And just like any other relationship, 
like we have here within the material world, when you get to know someone, when you put in time with someone, um, when you really begin to connect, it really starts to blossom. And that's the same as this Hare Krishna mantra. The more uh, attentive you are, uh, the more patience you have with this mantra, the more time you spend with this mantra, it's a relationship because it's a personality, it's Krishna. And it's forever growing, it's forever expanding, it's boundless, the feelings that we get from this because it's our relationship with Krishna. So it's very beautiful. So that is a very important mantra. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. All glory to Shri Hopa. Yeah.